There's neither a national emergency uh, nor is it an emergency. It absolutely is an emergency, and the president is totally correct. There's a, there's a national emergency that exists, but it's sitting at the 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Here in El Paso sector, criminal alien uh, arrests were up by 65%. It's our American policies and politics that have sowed so much disorder in those countries. We need a wall. We need a wall. This does not have to be happening right now. We are seeing a mass exodus of families from Central America. And if they don't stop them, we're closing the border. They'll close it, and we'll, we'll keep it closed for a long time. I'm not playing games. Obviously, you close the door, people will come around the door. The sheer volume um, that's coming in of family units is, is what's overwhelming. But our communities are not overwhelmed. Our communities are ready and available with open arms. People don't know how hard it is to leave everything behind. We're going to continue to have these problems. We're the second highest crossing. We had over a thousand apprehensions in this one sector alone. Nobody thinks that we want everybody here. You know, we just want a system that works. In the sprawling desert where southern New Mexico meets West Texas, it could seem as though the cactus and creosote bush are trying to hold back the shifting sand. Alongside that struggle, something else is starting to take root. So we're going to confront the national security crisis on our southern border, and we're going to do it one way or the other. We have to do it. On February 15th, President Trump declared a national emergency at the U.S.-Mexico border. The declaration gives the president access to billions of dollars to build a long-promised border wall. If the president's emergency declaration withstands legal challenges, his border wall would likely look a lot like this steel structure here in Sunland Park, New Mexico. This is what the Border Patrol calls a bollard wall. It doesn't look anything like the president's prototypes. This is the officially sanctioned design. It's 18 feet high. Agents are able to see right through those bollards there, and those steel plates up on top are meant to stop people from climbing over. From South Texas to Southern California, sections like this have already been built, mostly as replacements or enhancements to much more modest barriers. In Washington, the debate over the need or the effectiveness of a wall could continue well past 2020. But here on the border, a humanitarian and bureaucratic crisis is happening right now. 90% of the people in El Paso don't know what goes on here. They have no idea. Jeff Allen lives on a piece of private land that straddles the U.S.-Mexico border near West El Paso a stretch of land without a wall or fence. I'm tired, I'm tired of the drug trafficking coming through here. Uh, it's, 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 it's all day and all night. He says every day, dozens of people cross illegally into the country right through his property. If the federal government would come and build a wall down here, I'd let them do it for free. I don't need to profit from it. I need the safety from it. I'm not trying to you know, convince people that something that's not true. I know something is true, and I want to bring people here and show you a totally insecure border. Right down the road from Allen's house, Gavin Clarkson is standing at what's known as Monument One, a white obelisk that denotes the dividing line between Mexico and the United States. Here also, there is no wall or fence. That's Mexico, that's the US. For somebody in Washington, D.C. to tell us that this is a secure border is a is it an immense lie. Clarkson lives in southern New Mexico. In the Trump administration, he served briefly as a deputy assistant secretary for policy and economic development. He ran unsuccessfully for Congress in 2018, but now he has his sights set on a new priority, border security. Because every single day, you have people gaming the immigration system. They come over here, they, they'll fly to Ciudad Juarez from Brazil. Not Central America, Brazil. They walk over here, 
They've got a child in one hand. They got the carry-on lug in the other hand. They know how the game is played. They show up. They say, Asilo. Clarkson has created a series of YouTube videos to illustrate what he says is a highly vulnerable border. You know, none of our lawmakers are willing to address those problems because it doesn't fit their narrative. He says Brazilian migrants in particular use this open stretch of border next to Monument One to bypass the ports of entry and declare asylum. Yep, here you go. Yeah. Oh God, so they're surrendering. Unveiling. At the end of our interview, as if on cue, a group of migrants is dropped off at the border. They walk into the United States and directly toward Border Patrol agents who take them into custody. So we just saw what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, so you saw that they had their carry-on luggage for the airplane, yeah. small children in their arms, and they're going to go surrender. They're, they notice that they're, they're running. We didn't have the green stripes on our, on our vehicle, so they know we're not Border Patrol. So they are, they are going over to Border Patrol right now to surrender. The Border Patrol says this kind of scenario is happening all day, every day, typically in much larger numbers, in areas with or without walls or barriers. The influx of migrants hit a new milestone on March 6th. That's when more than a thousand migrants surrender to border agents in El Paso in a single day. Another one just, two people just dropped down over there close to the uh, checkpoint. What seemed remarkable then was only the start of what would soon become an unprecedented spring along the southwestern border. If you compare El Paso sector numbers, even just a year ago, here in this sector, we were sixth or seventh busiest in the United States. Ten months later, we became the second busiest sector. Border Patrol Chief Aaron Hull grew up in nearby Las Cruces, New Mexico. He has spent more than two decades with the agency. And in early 2018, he was named sector chief in El Paso, an area that includes a huge part of New Mexico. Almost overnight, we went from traffic that was relatively manageable to numbers that were rapidly exceeding our capacity to hold aliens, um, pushing our, our capacity to prosecute those who needed to be prosecuted. When Hull started his career, the Border Patrol was apprehending mostly Mexican men who could be deported quickly. But that was then. Now, he says the Border Patrol is dealing with a dramatic surge in Central American migrants, many of them family units, seeking asylum in the U.S. We understand that many of those people do have legitimate uh, fear of returning to their country, legitimate asylum claims. Mm -hmm. However, we're also seeing a very large number of people who are claiming things to be allowed to remain here legally, um, knowing that they'll be released on their own recognizance, potentially for years before they're ever heard, their case is heard by a judge. We also have people choosing to bring children, even renting children, or fraudulently claiming that a child is theirs, because they are under the belief that if they come in with a child, that they will be released pending their own recognizance for a hearing again in a distant future time that they may never appear for. So that's happening. That's so that is happening. He says many Central American migrants and their smugglers have learned that claiming asylum is an end run around the immigration system. We've already caught more so far in these first uh, four months of the year than we did all of last year. The numbers are going up again and they're taking advantage of these loopholes. And until we address those, those elements, the fact that people believe that they're gonna be allowed to remain in the United States even after these agents catch them, it's gonna undermine all the hard work that everyone has done to get the border under control because there's that pull factor which is encouraging people to challenge us. In the middle of our interview, as we inspected a section of wall that's under construction near downtown El Paso, we were interrupted by a group of migrants. There's people coming there? Oh yeah, about a group of 20 looks like. Oh, come to the yeah, see oh, there, there, there. They waded across the Rio Grande from Ciudad Juarez, then walked calmly toward border agents. They were a group of six men and five children, all from Guatemala, and they were asking for asylum in the United States. They are making an illegal entry. Now, most of them are not trying to evade us. They're presenting themselves at apprehension. Okay. But the key thing to remember there, it is still part of a smuggling cycle that occurs. The difference now is that their smugglers don't have to enter the United States and risk being arrested and prosecuted by us because they can merely drop them off at the border and say, walk north, which is what they do until they're encountered by us. By March 27th, the situation had intensified. CBP is facing an unprecedented humanitarian and border security crisis all along our southwest border, and nowhere has that crisis manifested more acutely than here in El Paso. 
Kevin McAleenan is the Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection. At a news conference in El Paso, he said the system was being overwhelmed by thousands of Central American migrants arriving at the border every day. We are now on pace for over 100,000 apprehensions and encounters with migrants in March, with 90% of those 90,000 people crossing the border illegally between ports of entry. March will be the highest month since 2008. To deal with the waves of migrants and the demands of caring for the sick and the young, McAleenan said his agency would take drastic measures. To help process the large number of migrants, 750 federal agents were moved away from ports of entry, where most of the illegal narcotics enter the country. There will be impacts to traffic at the border. There will be a slowdown in the processing of trade. There will be wait times in our pedestrian and passenger vehicle lanes. We know that we have Semana Santa, Holy Week approaching, but this is required to help us manage this operational crisis. Also, the Border Patrol closed several checkpoints, what are considered by many as a last line of defense. When it comes to detention space, the Border Patrol says it's simply run out of room. Perhaps the most dramatic example of that assertion, this temporary holding facility under an international bridge near downtown El Paso. Hundreds of migrants were kept huddled together in a makeshift center while they're being processed. As I walked near the fence, these people told me that they hadn't bathed for days. They say children are sick and in need of medical attention. They say they're cold and desperate. These images, children sleeping on the ground, people penned behind chain link and razor wire, these images evoke a visceral reaction. The optics here attract the local and national media. So, so, so it is. Because, I mean, you have people in El Paso in an underpass, fenced in right. with barbed wire. The situation here also attracts demonstrators who employ their own imagery. This is modern day Gestapo. Well, I mean, just look, look behind you. Um, would you put your children in this position? Um, it's inhumane. It's, I mean, people are on the wrong side of history. People don't want to see this for what it really is. We have migrants in our custody that are in challenging conditions. We need to provide a better facility and a better process uh, for them urgently, and that requires interagency partnership and resources. At his news conference in El Paso, Commissioner McAleenan did not discuss barriers. He talked about legislative relief. He said the answer to the current crisis can only come from Congress. Changes in the law and closing the vulnerabilities in our legal framework is the only way that this flow is going to be reduced and we're going to be able to restore integrity to our immigration system. I will tell you, I agree that Congress has a very critical role. El Paso Congresswoman Veronica Escobar took office in January. The laws are long overdue in changing, but I'll tell you, if they're critical of, of this Congress, I'm interested in knowing why they weren't critical the last two years when the Republican Party had an iron grip over the House, the Senate, and the White House, when they were getting anything and everything done that they wanted to do. Suddenly, they want Congress to change the laws 90 days in. I'm working on it. We are working together with members of Congress to change laws in a humane way. At her own news conference, the freshman Democrat said the Trump administration in general and the Department of Homeland Security in particular has failed to adapt to changes in immigration patterns. This is one of the most well-funded agencies in the federal government, and yet they are unable or unwilling to spend the money that taxpayers have given them in a strategic, thoughtful, humane way. Instead, their response is to build walls. Yes, the, when Commissioner McAleenan was here, he stood in front of a wall complaining about the number of migrants that uh, were being apprehended. They're being apprehended where there's a wall. So walls don't work, we know that. So will a border wall solve the migration issues that we're dealing with right now? The border wall does not address asylum seekers because asylum seekers want to get onto the physical territory of the United States. So the border wall is actually helping them do that. 
Josiah Heyman is the director of the Center of Inter-American and Border Studies at the University of Texas at El Paso. Most of the El Paso sector is already walled off. What there, there is a space of a few feet, a few yards, um, but between the actual international border and the wall. And what we're seeing now within the last few days is uh, people going into that area, which is inside the United States, and making themselves known to Border Patrol officers and waiting until they are arrested. So in case that's not exactly clear, this is what the professor is saying. When migrants present themselves to Border Patrol at the wall, they're actually already on American soil, even if they're on the south side of the wall. It took a while for asylum seekers to figure this out, but now the word has gotten out among them that it doesn't make sense to enter through the port of entry. Again, these barriers can't encroach on the Mexican side of the border, so they're built a few feet to the north. This is Monument 6, as it looked in the 1890s. Here it is today, on the other side of this newly constructed bollard wall in New Mexico. At the wall, they're actually able to get onto the territory of the country. That gives them a tool to initiate their asylum case. So they, it's the ironic blowback of the wall. They're better off just standing in big crowds right up against the wall on the territory of the United States. It's important to know the legal framework sets up the physical territory of the United States as the place from which people can ask for asylum. And that's in U.S. law. In the past, even the president has acknowledged that walls don't always work. The only weakness is they go to a wall and then they go around the wall. They go around the wall and in. But on his campaign stop in El Paso in February, the president made it clear that El Paso's existing barriers are a case in point. And there's no place better to talk about border security, whether they like it or not. Because I've been hearing a lot of things, oh, the wall didn't make that much of a difference. You know where it made a big difference? Right here in El Paso. The migrants that are coming north from, from Central America are coming in legally based on what our, our system allows for the claim of asylum. El Paso Mayor DeMargo says the debate over border barriers won't help the city manage the hundreds of migrants arriving every day, nor does it address the strain on local resources, including our ports of entry. Well, the sound bites have all focused on the, uh, the, the, the fence or the wall. Yeah. And my point is, you know, that's fine. That's part and parcel to whatever you need um, for border security, but that doesn't deal with the immigration issue. It's not like they're coming across illegally. They are claiming asylum under our laws. That's what your viewers need. They are claiming asylum correctly, properly, legally as a result of our laws. And until we change that law, we're going to continue to have this problem. Still, asylum law notwithstanding, Sector Chief Hull believes in walls and barriers as tools that help agents do a difficult job. It's not a catch-all solution, but it helps us control people who are trying to enter between the ports of entry. Because the only legal way to enter the country is through a port of entry. Anything between the ports is illegal, and that's why we're here is to stop that. Again, most of these Central American migrants aren't trying to sneak into the country. They're surrendering at the border. Typically, the Border Patrol would turn the migrants over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. Once in ICE custody, migrants could be detained for days or weeks, but not anymore. ICE detention facilities are at capacity. So if they don't have a criminal record, migrants are being released by the Border Patrol. For the first time in over a decade, CBP is performing direct releases of migrants when ICE is unable to provide bed space to relieve overcrowding. We're gonna be doing this on a risk basis. This is in a limited capacity, it's very reluctantly, but it, rep and it represents a negative outcome for enforcement. It, it represents an increase in flows that will follow. 
uh, and it impacts the morale of our team. Yeah, our, our facilities are, are beyond overcapacity. Corey Price is the field office director for Immigration and Customs Enforcement in El Paso. The, the numbers coming in every day um, has simply overrun our system. Price is a 20-year veteran of the agency who's worked under Republican and Democratic presidents. He says loopholes in current immigration law and the influx of Central American families in particular have created the perfect storm. Our enforcement has no teeth. We are, we are not able to, to stop it because there is no enforcement. We have no infrastructure. They know that they are overrunning us and there's nothing we can do about it. So what's the disincentive for somebody to, to not try? So what's at play? The Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008 does not allow for the quick deportation of children from Central America. The law was designed to protect them from human traffickers and current law allows asylum seekers to remain in the U.S. while their cases are processed. And a settlement and subsequent court ruling limit the time that families can be detained. I think the impact wasn't as great when, when the volume was much lower, but now with this volume, I mean, it's, it's I mean, a lot of them will call it uh, a loophole, and, and it, quite frankly, it's, it's a huge uh, gap. So every day in El Paso, ICE and now the Border Patrol are releasing hundreds of migrants on what amounts to be the honor system. There's a lot of frustration and um, there's frustration among the American people. Uh, there's frustration with, with you know, the residents of El Paso uh, and there's residents, you know, with our staff or frustration with our staff. Um, you know, our staff is overwhelmed. Um, they are pulled away from their normal duties to go out there and simply, you know, serve order of recognizance paperwork on these, these people that they know are not going to get removed. Some migrants are equipped with ankle monitors, but the demand has exceeded supply. The vendors that we partner with um, do their best to keep up. Um, but uh, it, in my opinion, it is, it is not just a matter of the ankle monitors. The fact of the matter is even if they get the ankle monitors, several of them, you know, cut the ankle monitors off. Historically, the numbers are down. In 2000, about 1.6 million people were apprehended at the border. By 2018, that number was down 75% to 400,000. But right now, border arrests are at a 10-year high. In the El Paso sector, the Border Patrol is averaging 570 apprehensions a day, with 90% of those being in the El Paso area. Migrants have another option when they arrive at the border. They can wait in Mexico. They sign a ledger and wait sometimes for weeks before they're allowed to pass through a port of entry to make their asylum claim. We have made it hard for people to enter the country through the ports of entry. Here in El Paso through the bridges by posting CBP officers at the international line. I mean, this is something that we've seen now for a year, and CBP officers have been standing there stopping people that they suspect of coming to enter an asylum claim. They're only allowing small numbers in. Uh, they're making people wait for weeks. On a clear morning in March, El Paso County Commissioner David Stout drives me to a migrant shelter in Ciudad Juarez. So we uh, just crossed into Juarez and we're driving driving south right now, uh, going to El Gimnasio de Bachilleres, which is uh, basically a immigrant shelter here in, on, on, in the Juarez side of the border. So we're not only doing this in, in El Paso, but uh, there are shelters being set up here in, in Juarez, and, and from what I understand, this one is actually run by, being run by the municipality, so the government, the local government. So they're already, looks like, expending resources and, and um, providing help to, to these folks, which is something that we're trying to do as well. El Paso County recently voted to spend $100,000 to help the local nonprofits that are helping to care for newly released migrants in El Paso. I'll push back and say that isn't the onus on the asylum seekers to, I mean, I'm sure you'll hear this from, con, from constituents, isn't the onus on the asylum seekers to come to terms with the fact that the system is at capacity right now, there is a, a line 
to get in. So why does it become El Paso County's problem that they're coming here to seek asylum? Well, I mean, I, th I think that uh, if they if they could, they'd probably stay where they are, where they live, where, where the, you know where I, they would stay there. But I think the the situation is so dire that they're forced to, to come here, and, and I don't even I, I don't think that uh, that you know that type of thought process probably is something that crosses their mind. I don't even know if they're told by the people that are bringing them here if they're you know if there's a huge line. I don't know how much information they have about what's going on in El Paso. I I, yeah. I guarantee probably zero. The migrant shelter in Juarez is a high school gymnasium where as many as 400 migrants are waiting to claim asylum in the U.S. Y la verdad es una situación de, de emergencia. Jorge Muñoz works for the state of Chihuahua, which is providing the funding for this shelter. He says he considers the current situation a state of emergency for the entire northern border of Mexico. He says the state is trying to keep up with the pressing needs of feeding and sheltering hundreds of people in a place that wasn't designed as a shelter. He says he wishes more people would donate items like toilet paper and soap because he says they're constantly running out. At this shelter, Munoz says migrants from Eastern Europe, Africa, and Cuba are mixed in with hundreds of Central American families. They're given numbers, like customers at a deli counter, and they wait for their number to be called. Immigration officials on the U.S. side of the border process about 10 to 15 people a day. Franklin Salazar is from Nicaragua. He and his wife and child are new arrivals at this shelter. Salazar says he'll wait his turn and claim asylum through the port of entry, even if he has to wait in Juarez for months. He says he doesn't want to be separated from his family, so they will wait. When you talk to migrants who make the journey north, their reasons for coming are often heartbreaking, often bleak. Whether they're fleeing from violence, oppression, or crushing poverty, their stories tend to share common themes. A lack of options back home and a desire for a better life in America. We, we, we don't understand, and, and, and we never will, but they cannot stay there, and, and, and we have to uh, we have to we have to help them out, you know, and, and, and I'm so happy to see that on this side of the border uh, That this community as well is taking care of these folks. It's now time to start talking about Im uh, Comprehensive immigration reform and, and what does that entail? First of all, I think one of the big things is looking at why people are coming the push and pull factors, the root causes. I mean, you can you can put up as, as much well as you can, but if these people are still living in countries where they don't have opportunities and they're living in fear like these people here, you're never gonna stop the flow. You're never gonna stop that flow. You have to address the root cause. And, and sadly enough, some of those root causes were, were, were provoked by the United States and our foreign policy when it comes to Central and South America. They're, there's not just leaving for economic reasons, they're leaving for kind of something that is a, a what could be described as a kind of a horrible mixture of violence, criminality, and uh, poverty. And it is, it is worse, it has worsened in two of the countries, in Honduras and Guatemala, and more people are pouring out of those countries. And I also think that, I mean, the conditions are getting worse and worse, but also people there are figuring out what they can do about them. Outside the shelter, I meet up with Martin Aguilar, a contributor to a talk radio station in Juarez. He has harsh words for the migrants. He says it's not our responsibility to care for these migrants. He says they should have been turned back at the southern border of Mexico. He says he speaks for many Juarez residents who are outraged that the government is spending money on people who don't have a legal right to be in Mexico. He says the people of Juarez should be a priority. 
I ask him if he supports President Trump's border wall. He says what Trump is doing is what's good for America. He says he wishes the Mexican president would do the same. In El Paso, there is a network of shelters that serve as temporary way stations when migrants are released from federal custody. Most of the shelters are run by church groups or religious organizations, and most are struggling to keep up with demand. This video was produced by the Catholic Diocese of El Paso in hopes of recruiting more volunteers to their shelters. It, it has always been something that Christians have done. We've always taken in people who needed a, a place to stay. When they're dropped off here by the bus, we go through the intake process. We find out who they are, who they're with, did they come alone, did they come with a spouse, did they come with children, where is their final destination, you know, because once they're here, they're going to go meet a family member somewhere. Ruben Garcia runs Annunciation House, the largest shelter in El Paso. He's been helping migrants for decades, but this latest wave has strained resources like never before. We consider a wave when the numbers released by ICE in a given week surpass 1,000 per week. So we've dealt with those kinds of numbers in the past. So what differentiates this wave from the past is that it's not one or 2,000. We're now looking at 3,500 to 4,000 and climbing. The migrants who are released on bond or their own recognizance don't stay at the shelters long, typically only one or two days. Volunteers help them make contact with their sponsors. Then the migrants make their way to cities across the United States. About two miles west of downtown Los Angeles, you'll come upon the Westlake District. It's a vibrant, crowded neighborhood made up largely of Central American immigrants. On the sidewalk along 6th Street, I meet Santiago. He's from San Salvador, the capital city of El Salvador. He tells me about how he made an asylum claim in El Paso, then came to Los Angeles with his adult son. He only wants to use his first name because he doesn't want it to affect his asylum claim. I came to pursue the American dream, he says, but instead I ended up sleeping on the streets. Santiago says life here is difficult and full of hardship, but he says the gangs back home made life impossible. Those seeking asylum are allowed work permits, but not until six months after their arrival. So like hundreds of others in this neighborhood, Santiago makes ends meet by selling used shoes and household goods. He's had a falling out with his family, so his living situation is tenuous at best. According to government statistics, as many as 70,000 asylum seekers live in the city of Los Angeles, and they come here and wait for their asylum cases to be processed. But the question becomes, why do they leave a place like El Paso, where the cost of living is cheaper, to come to L.A., where things are considerably more expensive? Almost anywhere else you go other than El Paso, you have a higher probability of winning an asylum case. Yeah. Cynthia Lopez is an immigration attorney based in El Paso. She hosts a podcast that focuses on immigration issues, and she's well-versed in asylum claims. El Paso is kind of a hub, so they come in here and then they kind of go to the other places. Uh, but usually, if we represent them for the bond and they get out, we usually recommend, you know, go ahead and move your case, look for an attorney over there, because you don't want to present your asylum case here. For example, in El Paso, our asylum judges have, well, our judges have um, less than a 5% approval rating on asylum cases. Um, it's one of the worst in the country. The first step in the asylum process is a credible fear screening with an asylum officer. Those interviews can take more than two hours. Whether they're detained or not detained, um, they have to pass the credible fear. Um, and the credible fear is basically, you know, what happened in your country? What are you afraid of? Who is it that's persecuting you? Um, and they're, they're checking to make sure that they have at least established a, a prima facie case for asylum. So they're seeing if, they have, if they're going to have the legal requisites to, to establish an asylum case. If a migrant doesn't establish credible fear, they're deported back to their home countries 
in what's called an expedited removal. Usually the judges will agree with, with the asylum officers and then they will just send them back. Mm -hmm. um, and then they usually have an expedited removal order, which is a five-year bar. Um, Oh, sorry, what does that mean, five-year bar? From coming back. Oh. So they'll have a five-year penalty. Usually if it's an expedited removal case, they'll have a five-year penalty and can't come back to the U.S. If they pass a credible fear screening, they'll have their case heard by an immigration judge at some point in the future. But because of the current backlog, some of those hearings can languish in the court system for years. You know, we do need more judges. We do need to process cases faster. I mean, we have cases that are pending for for years. Um, we don't need to put money into things like a wall. We have the money to do it, put it in places where we can actually use it. Talk to us attorneys, talk to the judges. Hey, what do we really need to do? Because that's the problem. One of the most amazing things, and, and until you're around Im actual immigration courts, you just can't believe this, is the, the U.S. government, which has billions of dollars and sophisticated workforces and so forth continually loses files. They're continually postponing cases. Their lawyers come to court and are unprepared. They have to postpone case, case after case after case and it gets pushed back and everything goes back. You know, that, that just lengthens the line. I mean, there is a breakdown on the part of the ICE lawyers and the ICE information system. Our Office of Chief Counsel is, is vastly understaffed, um, but I, I think that that's, a, a, you know, an unfair uh, accusation. I think that, that our attorneys do a tremendous job at representing the government. Um, that is their job, is to represent the government in these hearings. Um, so, so to say that, that ICE attorneys are not prepared for this, I think, is, is uh, an unfair characteriza characterization. Would you just say they're overwhelmed as everyone else is? They are absolutely overwhelmed. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't think there's an agency that's involved in the Im immigration enforcement life cycle that is not overwhelmed at this point. Back in Los Angeles, Santiago doesn't know what the future holds, but there are organizations that help migrants navigate the complicated immigration system. We put a lot of priority on trying to help the people, especially with these waves that are coming up right now, with trying to help them and trying to give them uh, legal representation, but it's never enough. Tessie Borden is with a group called CHIRLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles. We are also pushing for measures that actually afford people a kind of public defender for immigrants. Borden says the Trump administration is illegally trying to circumvent laws that allow migrants to apply for asylum. But the president's supporters say that the definition of an asylum seeker has been altered far beyond the original intent to include economic circumstances or sexual orientation. You're supposed to claim asylum the first safe country you come to, and Mexico is offered asylum, and they turn it down. So we, clearly this is a game that they're playing to try and get into the United States. These people are entitled by many international treaties to seek asylum. That doesn't mean they're entitled to getting it, but they are entitled to seeking it. And they're entitled to seeking it in this country. They shouldn't be forced to be waiting in another country where their situation is unsafe. I mean, we've seen the situations in Tijuana, and, and we've seen that many of these people, I mean, they were sleeping in mud holes, basically. Am I wrong in saying that you're responsible for essentially spearheading what would become national policy for the Border Patrol? No, that's true. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this was not the first place that I tried the strategy of hold the line. Silvestre Reyes is a former Democratic congressman from El Paso. He's also a former Border Patrol chief who implemented a policy called hold the line. The controversial strategy was implemented in September of 1993. About 430 Border Patrol agents were deployed along a 20-mile stretch of El Paso's border with Ciudad Juarez. It represented a fundamental shift in the way Border Patrol agents did their job. Instead of chasing after undocumented immigrants in a game of cat and mouse, agents remained in position along the border 
a human wall, and it worked. Uh, it changed dramatically. Uh, car thefts went down uh, over 96% overnight. Uh, all the, the burglaries, all, all of the, the kinds of criminal uh, activities that El Paso was wrestling with, uh, uh, they, we had an immediate impact on. Hold the line, dude. Hold the line, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Those officers on the line. It wasn't any fence that, as uh, the president likes to take credit for, it was the, the, the line of officers on that line 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and uh, we uh, went from chasing people to actually being there uh, visually, visually deterring them from entering the country illegally. Is there truth to the argument that prior to hold the line, that El Paso was dealing with a criminal element or an, uh, certainly the, the, the artifacts of criminal activity as a result of illegal crossings? Well, we, we used to average about 10,000 illegal entries a day. That's, that's a lot of people entering when you consider a month or a year. Yeah. And uh, in that, the, the, I, I should also say, those 10,000 illegal entries, most of them were people coming in to work at construction, uh, gardening, uh, maids. The, most of them were people that were coming in to work. Yeah. And, but in that mix, there were the criminal elements. There were the petty criminals. The, uh, and we're not talking about uh, uh, murders or rapists or any of that. They're just, just petty crime. As someone who comes from law enforcement, from Border Patrol, I would assume that maybe you would be in favor of a border wall. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, I am in favor of fencing where it makes sense. I was asked many times by people writing stories uh, back during Hold the Line uh, how much fencing uh, would the southern border require. And I estimated maybe 10 to 12 percent. The border between the U.S. and Mexico is about 2,000 miles long. So if you do the math, then, you, then you're talking about uh, a couple of hundred miles. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying uh, barriers where barriers make sense. Exactly. Um, but not along the entire strip. No, it, it, is, it is foolish to uh, spend taxpayer money, to waste taxpayer money in areas uh, like between the Santa Teresa and Palomos area. I mean, that's desert. This 20-mile stretch of Bollard Wall west of Santa Teresa, New Mexico, was built by the Trump administration at a cost of $73 million. It took less than a year to build, but Reyes says it'll do little to solve the problems in current immigration policy, nor will it deter people from entering the country to seek asylum. When people are out of options, all these hardships that uh, this administration seems to think would work uh, means nothing to them because their other option is to have their kids killed, raped, uh, abused, or their families' homes burned or otherwise. So they, they don't have uh, any option but to come here. That impedance and denial, that's where the wall comes in. Sector Chief Hull says walls can at least create some kind of control at the border even if they don't necessarily address what he describes as loopholes in the law. Any type of infrastructure that makes it more difficult to enter is a deterrent to those seeking to enter, and it also allows us to use our people more effectively. We actually need fewer agents where we have effective infrastructure. If there's no wall, no barrier of any kind, it's a very manpower-intensive endeavor to detect and apprehend those who are entering. If we build a wall there, it's not necessarily going to fix what you claim is the asylum fraud, right? right. Because right. they're surrendering themselves. Well, but we, it's not just going to be a physical barrier. It's got to be a multi-layered barrier with, with a primary barrier, high-tech monitoring, and then increased manpower in, in the form of brave men and women of CBP. Supporters of the president point to the threat of criminals coming into the country. Sometimes it's young women that they are importing in the United States for sexual slavery. 
The Border Patrol says criminals or drug smugglers often try to blend in with the large groups of families that enter the country, or they use the large groups as a diversion. It's an old smuggler technique to run aliens ahead of, ahead of dope loads to tie our people up while they get the more serious contraband across. As you can imagine, with numbers this large, how many people it ties up while they know that they can make entries in addition. Plus our criminal aliens are trying to take advantage of us being tied up as well. So we have smuggling organizations that are pairing up, you know, uh, children with adults to claim that they are, they are a family. You've uncovered that, you've seen yes, that. Yes, we have seen that. And our, our Office of Homeland Security Investigations, you know, investigate some of these. But because of the volume, there's, there's no way they can investigate all the claims. The same criminal organizations that are smuggling migrants, profiting from them, abusing them in the journey, are benefiting from our reduced security presence. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing adults who are trying to evade capture behind those families as we're bogged down with large groups. But others say that's a false narrative. There is an intentional distortion of reality, an intentional distortion of facts at the border, to try to paint our communities and paint immigrants in ways that they are not. Fernando Garcia is the founder and executive director of the Border Network for Human Rights, a group that advocates for immigrant rights in El Paso. I don't believe that there is a crisis, at least not the crisis that the president is talking about. But they want to feed the, the, the reality to that narrative of emergencies, of crisis, of national security threats which none of that is happening. However, uh, the president is, is somehow successfully been using this to promote a false political narrative nationally. If I'm to understand you correctly, Fernando, if we're going down this rabbit hole, you're saying the entire problem is actually a strategy on the part of the administration to create a narrative. The picture that you're seeing of 700 people crossing the border at a time it was the result of a specific strategy of, of pushing them back to Mexico instead of allowing them to come family by family into the United States. We just pushed them to a situation where they got desperate and they, they realized that the only way that their, their, their asylum petition would be accepted was not through the legal ways of ports of entry, it was between ports of entry. So that's how the situation was fabricated. They are doing exactly the opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. So it doesn't make sense. I mean, their solutions to the so-called crisis, they, they don't match with the problem. So neither moving officers away from ports of entry or building the wall are going to deal with this issue of influx of refugees. But beyond politics, Garcia says the border has become increasingly militarized. A, a civilian police should enforce the border, which is the Border Patrol. I mean, the Border Patrol is a federal civilian force, or at least it was in the past. But what we're seeing now is that the Border Patrol, it is using more and more military tactics, technology, instruments, so it's been militarized. And obviously there are some big corporations gaining out of it. I mean, who is building the walls? Who is uh, uh, really developing the technology, the drone systems? Many individual corporations that they sell weapons and arms are getting profit out of enforcement. That is one level, it is true, it is pro it's proven. But it's not enough. I mean, it, it seems that that was not enough for them. Now they deployed the National Guard. And if that was not enough, then they brought active duty soldiers 5,000 of them, people that were trained to go to Iraq, Afghanistan or Syria, they are being sent to the border. People that had not been trained, soldiers that had not been trained in civil, civil interaction, civilian enforcement, we have them deployed at the border. And if that was not enough, in El Paso that was just the announcement of having these militias. In New Mexico, the governor has withdrawn the National Guard troops that were deployed to the border. So now citizen militia groups stand guard. This group is called United Constitutional Patriots. Since we've been up there, we've got 68 Somalians, 700 Guatemalans, seven Muslims, 
18 Venezuelans, all in a matter of 12 days in that area that, we're, that we are at. Dozens of them patrol the desert near Sunland Park, New Mexico. They say they're there to help an overwhelmed border patrol. And these illegals, they come through Mexico like it's, they're not being stopped. You know, so we're catching as many as we can, you know, and we're not making a, we're not making a dent in what, what comes over yearly. I mean, we're just trying to do our best you know, when the United Constitutional Patriots, we started this, and we're the first boots on the ground. I wasn't able to confirm if the Constitutional Patriots have actually helped in apprehending anyone, but the Border Patrol says they don't want their help. Uh, we are not asking for civil society groups to provide border security assistance. Uh, we work very closely with citizens who see issues uh, in their neighborhoods or in their areas, and we respond to that. But we do not need uh, citizen groups to help uh, patrol the border. Thank you. They are answering the call of the president, they say, that they need to protect the, the country for, from security threats. And when you ask them, what are, which are the security threats, they cannot tell. Because when they say, well, it's terrorism, zero terrorist, zero of them being arrested in this border. But you know the good thing about what's happening, the rush to the border. Another two caravans now are pouring up. Mexico could stop them so easy. And you know what? If they don't, it's going to cost them a hell of a lot of money, honestly. Because they could do it so easy. So easy. And if they don't, and I'm telling you right now, we will close the damn border. At a rally in Michigan on March 28th, President Trump threatened to close down the southwest border. And he had this to say about Central American asylum seekers. And they come out, they're all met by the lawyers, and they say, say the following phrase. I am very afraid for my life. I am afraid for my life. Okay. And then I look at the guy. He looks like he just got out of the ring. He's the heavyweight champion of the world. He's afraid for us. It's a big, fat con job, folks. It's a big, fat con job. And he once again reiterated his call for a border wall. Currently, the Pentagon is planning to divert a billion dollars to build 57 miles of new barriers in the Yuma and El Paso sectors. We're defending borders of countries that are 6,000 miles away, that many of you have never even heard the name of these countries, but our southern border, our border along Mexico, where we have a lot of problems, and drugs, and human traffickers, and child traffickers. And all of this coming in, we don't want to defend our border. Think of that, how crazy that is. Thank you all for being here. On March 30th, a former congressman from El Paso officially kicked off his campaign for the presidency. So grateful to this community of El Paso. Beto O'Rourke was born and raised in El Paso. Since announcing his run for the White House, he has climbed to the top ranks of a crowded field of Democratic contenders. And his border policy stands in stark contrast to that of the current president. If we truly believe that we are a country of immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees, and they are the very premise of our strength, of our success, and yes, our security, then let us free every single dreamer from any fear of deportation. With the Basa del Norte International Bridge as his backdrop, O'Rourke touted the virtues of El Paso's binational traditions. And he made specific mention of the migrants being held under that bridge, less than a mile behind his stage. And let's remember that every single one of us, including those who are just three or four blocks from here, detained under the international bridge that connects us with Mexico, behind chain link fence and barbed wire, that they are our fellow human beings and deserve to be treated like our fellow human beings. 
By the very next day, that temporary detention facility under the bridge had been dismantled. The migrants were moved to a border patrol station in northeast El Paso. The way I see it, bro, is that they should get him and deport the hell out of here, deport him out of here. Martin Silva works at a parking lot right across the street from the Paso del Norte bridge. Over the years, he says he has seen the number of illegal crossings in that area grow larger. Now, dude, it's waves, bro. For real, it's waves. It's not just one or two, man. It's not just one or two. Like I said, the most I've seen is 50 of them. The less I've seen is like 18, 20 of them. On April 3rd, Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen visited that facility under the Paso del Norte Bridge as part of a border tour. Four days later, she announced her resignation. In her resignation letter, Nielsen said, I hope that the next secretary will have the support of Congress and the courts in fixing the laws which have impeded our ability to fully secure America's borders and which have contributed to the discord in our nation's discourse. On that same day, President Trump announced that CBP Commissioner Kevin McAleenan would be taking over as Interim Secretary of Homeland Security. On the streets of a border town, with the possibility of a border shutdown looming, there is unease in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. Such a move would have far-reaching effects on the entire economy, but certainly on the El Paso Juarez borderplex. The reduced manpower at our ports of entry almost immediately resulted in huge delays for commercial traffic. The mayor of Juarez released this drone footage showing hundreds of big rigs backed up for miles waiting to cross into El Paso. And with spring turning to summer, the weather is starting to warm up. That means more migrants will be making the journey north. According to Homeland Security, they're expecting as many as 150,000 migrants a month for the next three months. So if we're at a breaking point now, there's no telling what the future holds in store. You know, all of us, you know, are, are humane. You know, all of us have, have feelings and thoughts on, on all of it. Um, there's, there's very, we're very limited on what we can do. Um, you know, when you see these, these vast numbers, I mean, you're, you know, that pulls at your heartstrings on the reasons that they're coming. And, and it also, in the same, uh, you know, breath, it, it, it pulls on you because there's nothing we can do about it. Um, you know, there's nothing we can do to stop that flow, that significant, you know, influx that we're seeing at our borders. We are a nation of immigrants, and that used to be the ideal of America. We used to be proud of that. You know, yes, all of this diversity came and built this exceptional country. But not anymore. Now we're going to reject them. Well, that is anti-historic. And you know what? At the end of the day, that can be the doom of, of the United States. Why? Because whether you want it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether your ideology allows you to think it or not, immigrants in the past that were essential to build America, they are now and they will be in the future. I mean, I, I say a lot that, you know, I'm one of the biggest supporters and proponents of legal immigration there is. Uh, I think you have to be in order to enforce those laws. There's a reason we have our immigration laws. There's a reason we have the system we have. And when it's simply overrun or flat out ignored, um, that's, that's when we get into a situation like we have now. It's my deep belief that this U.S.-Mexico border it is the new Ellis Island. That this is a moment of opportunity. That these immigrants are coming to strengthen the nation, not to weaken what we are.